Okay, I think we can go ahead and start now. I have a general intro, let's see. Right. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for this webinar on incentives and rewards for civic science, training and capacity building for the next generation of policy change makers. This event is organized by the Journal of Science Policy and Governance as part of a larger partnership with Sigma Xi and the Rita Allen Foundation who are co-sponsoring a special issue on civic science um, and this event. So um, thank you for your support. Um, as we'll talk about the deadline for the special issues, October 29th. So we have um, these events leading up to the to the deadline. The call for papers um, is promoting the concept of civic science to broad audiences, aiming to provide a platform for emerging leaders in civic science to showcase the policy implications of their work and elevate policies needed to advance civic science initiatives to serve society. So it's a broad call for papers. So we'll discuss uh, a number of these topics um, today in the next event. And also want to thank the outreach partners um, who have been really helpful in promoting the call for papers and these events. Um, so I want to just acknowledge them now. So thank you to ERIS, uh, UCS, ESL, CCST for your partnership on the special issue as well. Um, really helpful to um, promote the work. And we, you can see the link um, to the call for papers here. I can share it in the chat later as well. Um, but I uh, wanted to give you a background about what we've done so far. Um, so in July, we held a policy writing workshop and this is the first, this first discussion um, really looking at um, the civic science concepts for, with experts um, in the field and we'll explore different facets of the civic science space. So we encourage you to, to register um, for the webinar um, coming up as well. And uh, we'll provide more information later on that. So by way of introduction, my name is Adriana Bankston. I'm currently the CEO and managing publisher for the journal. I wanna give you a little background on, the, on JSPG for those that don't know what we do and uh, what this event is for. So we are an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed journal. Um, we're also a nonprofit and we do a lot of educational events um, to bolster research and writing credentials for, for students and early career scholars, um, as well as um, encourage them to engage in policy at all levels of government. We publish a number of different um, formats here, as you can see, a lot of different topics. Uh, a lot of them revolve around science policy, also other types of areas um, that you can see here. And you're welcome to check out the website for more information. We publish um, two, two standard issues and two to four special topics. Um, so as we're doing today, um, the uh, civic science is a special issue sponsored by partnering organizations and focused in topic. Um, eligibility is limited to early career, uh, which we define as students, postdocs, policy fellows within five years and also and or uh, under 30. So we really try to keep this um, true, true to the mission that we have to serve the next generation and folks who are up and coming in the field. Um, we also have a number of opportunities to engage uh, with published work. So for published authors um, to make the work a little more uh, relevant in the real world. So we submitted an R a response um, to this RFI from OSTP uh, a few years ago uh, based on published papers, which is related to the future of science policy and diversity in STEM. And so the authors were really happy to have their ideas included. And we also have a few media engagements. Uh, we try to promote published work in different outlets. So this is one that we had highlighted in Inside Higher Ed and also by Northwestern. So this was published by um, some graduate students at Northwestern who um, um, had this uh, press release on the publication. Um, we also have a number of professional development opportunities uh, as we're doing with these events. Of course, they're sort of standalone educational events too, but um, we do encourage trainees to engage with the journal in other ways too. So we have editorial board, which is um, the applications are open now um, until September 3rd. 
this is a good way to learn about policy and, and help edit papers on a number of topics. We also do career panels. We have an ambassador program also for undergrads and grad students to engage. And uh, recently, for the third time, partnered with UC Irvine with on this um, policy certificate program, which is also a good way to learn about um, different skills in policy. And last but not least, we highlight published work um, through presentations and panels. So just to highlight a few things here, we had a panel with um, uh, the UK Science and Innovation Network, who co-sponsored one of our issues in 2021, and so the authors presented at the British Embassy. Um, this was really exciting for them, and uh, of course, early in COVID times, and so they it was virtual, but um, really exciting for them to be able to talk about their work uh, with the embassy. Uh, we uh, This is just an example. We work with SACNAS, and then also we have a, a podcast where we interview authors. Um, one thing also, um, authors themselves have um, highlighted their work and, and tried to discuss it. Actually, we had a nice um, example here of two PhD students at Carnegie Mellon who um, uh, went to Capitol Hill to talk about their memo, essentially, and, uh, and wrote a nice blog summary for that. So again, trying to make this relevant and... and um, um, things that are actually going on in policy now. Uh, I won't go through this, but I wanted to show you a few testimonials that we have uh, from authors. We've, you know, have collected these quotes over the past 10 years um, to show that it's really valuable for their careers. And so we hope that um, these things, these will um, incentivize you to submit to us as well. So here's an author quote. We also had an editor and then um, um, staff as well. So that's all for the introduction right now. Um, so now I want to pass this on to Christian Ross, who will provide um, some brief context about the Civic Science Fellows Program before we go into the panel today. Thanks, Adriana. Um, so even before all that, let me say, in case it wasn't clear, JSPG is really, really cool. And I am biased because I used to be the editor in chief for the journal, but it's a really great opportunity for people to get involved in science policy, science writing, um, really is nothing quite like it. So again, shameless plug, please submit to this special issue. It is literally my job, but also it's gonna be really a valuable uh, experience for all of you. So that being set aside, my name is Christian Ross. I'm a research consultant with the uh, Rita Allen Foundation. Previously, I was a postdoc in civic science at Tufts University. I've been swimming in this kind of civic science waters for a little bit of time now. But um, my role today is really just to say a little bit about the three great panelists that we have and the Civic Science Fellows Program that they've all participated in. So I'm not a fellow. I'm not a former fellow. They all are. So I want you all to hear from them mostly. Um, but this is a little bit of context. Um, the Civic Science Fellows Program is an initiative started in 2020 by the Rita Allen Foundation. And really the goal is to place uh, early career folks who are exceptional experts in their areas in organizations and host, host partners uh, for about 18 months to advance civic science goals, whether that be in advancing evidence-based practices or equity or community engagement, science communication, many different kinds of things. As I think you'll hear, civic science as an idea is very, uh, we'll say broad, or it is as diverse as the people who actually do it, as I think um, someone said there's a little bit before this call. So uh, my Big plug is to say, listen closely to these folks. They're really, really cool. They have some fantastic experience um, that you could learn a lot. And in the event that you are also interested in this program more, shameless plug, see the website below. Um, this coming year, there will be another cohort of civic science fellows that you can apply to be. I don't believe the applications are live right now, um, but they will be um this fall, I want to say. Uh, don't hold me to that. But soon, this year, it will be starting in 2024. So if you like what you see a little bit today, please do consider applying to the Civic Science Fellows Program. So with that, I really want to hand it back so we can talk with our wonderful panelists today. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. Um, all right. So then We'll move on to um, introduce the panelists. So really excited um, for the speakers that we have today to talk to you about civic science. And as Christian said, they're 
current or former fellows um, who have worked on a number of projects related to this topic. So you'll hear about them. So first we have Erica Kimmerling, who's a former Civic Science Fellow and Senior Advisor for Science Engagement Policy and Partnerships at the Association of Science and Technology Centers. And she launched the Leaders in Science and Technology Networks or LISTEN Network. She has a PhD in biochemical, sorry, biomedical engineering. She got her civic science start in grassroots science communication training, and her policy work has focused on increasing community participation and engagement in science. Next, we have Andrea Lopez, who's a civic science fellow with Ciencia Puerto Rico, and she was born and raised in Puerto Rico and holds an MPH in community health from the City University of New York uh, Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And her work focuses on science communication, public health, and civic science. And last but not least, uh, Joanna Sheath is a clinical associate professor at Tulane um, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and also associate director for the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program. And she was previously a civic science fellow um, with the Civic Science with the Science Society program and was promoted to Associate Director in 2023. So um, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna stop sharing now and uh, move on to our introduction. Um, all right, so um, as we all are um, wondering this question, um, how you all, uh, what defines civic science? I think it's, it has a lot of facets as we've discussed and you all work in different spaces. Um, so let's start with that and see um, um, what, how you would define it and how you think uh, we should be governing civic science. So we can start with Erica. Hello everyone, uh, good local time to all of you. Excited to be on the webinar uh, with you today. Um, so what is civic science? Uh, I think I was the person on the call right before the call who said it. it's as varied as the people who are part of this community. Um, I think the easiest way to actually think about civic science is to compare it to a different version of science, which is academic science. And you can do civic science in the context of academic science. But when it comes to the systems and structures and incentives academic science rewards as outcomes, you know, publications, patents, certain types of technological innovations. And it's, it's, it is really first and foremost oriented towards communication and outputs in the academic community. So knowledge that really, you know, you share with your peers and like all the reward systems are really oriented to the academic community, even if it is a public good because most of it is funded by um, the federal government. Civic science to me is a reframing of what science can be with the end outcome of the really focusing on benefiting all people. So the civic space. So the idea that like science should be developed, communicated, um, engaged with based on knowing it will have a civic, um, in, you know, strengthen our civic spaces so and, and engage with in a universal way. So when you think about it benefiting all people, really you have to rethink systems and structures and skills because people need to be able to um, access the science. So, you know, science and people need to be able to communicate the science so that it is existing outside of an academic environment. It has to be, um, you know, engaged with in a bi-directional way so that it is informed by and developed with uh, the insights of the people who it's trying to impact and, you know, better yet, driven by the communities that we're, you know, wishing science to be beneficial to. Um, so that's kind of how I think of the, you know, the difference between, you know, civic science and other types of sciences. And like I said, it can exist in the academic space, but the systems and structures are not. Um, inclined to support that type of deep level of engagement. And it's why it's such a big tent, because if you pick apart the training piece, the skills piece, the capacity building piece, um, and the policy, it's all, you know, all that has to come together to create a world of civic science. And it depends on whether or not you're doing um, what I like to call band-aid solutions from academic science to civic science. So you're creating pathways to civic science and the, the systems we have now, or whether or not you're considering wholesale entirely different ways of doing science. And a lot of the like community science efforts really 
challenge the whole models to begin with. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I feel like I can go on in a bunch of different directions. I'm really curious what my panelists uh, think about civic science. Yeah, that's a really good start. So I'll pass it on to Andrea and then Joanna if you want to chime in on this too. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be participating in this panel. Um, whenever I'm asked to describe civic science, I always kind of steal Ciencia Puerto Rico's mission because I very much think it embodies what civic science is in a kind of soundbite. Um, to me, civic science is putting science in the hands and at the service of, in Ciencia Puerto Rico's case, Puerto Ricans, but in the broader sense, it can be society. Um, so, and they have all, uh, Adriana mentioned this, Christian mentioned this, um, we all in the fellowship kind of come from different backgrounds and areas of expertise. Some of us are more science communication or public health focused. We have others who are more advocacy or maybe policy or data driven. But what ties us and what brings us together is that desire to kind of connect science to society. society. And as Erica kind of mentioned, kind of take it away from this like academic and stereotypical idea of what science is and have it be more of a conversation um, instead of like a one-sided dialogue. Um, I just saw, sorry, one of the questions about civic science and community-based participatory research. And I uh, there's very much a relationship there, I think. I do come from public health and all of my experiences in community-based participatory research. So I very much kind of copy paste a lot of the lessons I've learned in community-based uh, participatory research and bring it to my civic science um, work, but I'll pass it on to Jelana to see if she has any other insights. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I do agree with my uh, panelists, and Andrea and I come from similar backgrounds, so public health and community-based um, research, and so um, I agree with um, what they've said in terms of uh, citizen science essentially being, um, you know, I'd say not the norm when we think of like science in an academic space. Um, and at the same time, um, a, a tool to kind of engage with um, communities um, at the intersection of, you know, science and society. And so one thing about citizen science is in my own research is that it helps to get at the root cause and understand like the, the systems that are in place that maybe are leading to um, some of society's most uh, pressing challenges, but then also those um, the stakeholders and then the perceptions um, and lived experiences of, um, of the people collecting the data. So like or the, the citizens. Um, um, and so um, again, like Andrea said, I, it's very close in from my own experience to like CBPR, so community-based participatory um, research. And I think we'll get to this question later, but I'll share how I've used it in, in academic and in nonprofit uh, spaces. Oh, and I will add that for me, um, citizen science is more of a, a like an umbrella term. Um, so some people call it community science, some say citizen science. And so from my own experience, and I'll explain to, I'll define citizen science later, like that is my primary engagement with this concept of like civic science. Great, right, thank you all. That that was a good introduction. I want to go back to something that Erica or um, Andrea mentioned about um, Ciencia Puerto Rico as an example and sort of how your organization engages, because I think it would be helpful to give a few examples of the kind of work you all do going back to this. So um, maybe Andrea, if you can expand more on how your uh, organization works with civic science. Sure. So as I mentioned, I think Ciencia Puerto Rico really embodies a lot of the civic science principles. Um, and we really do strive to put science at the hands and to the service of Puerto Ricans. Um, and I guess I can go over some of the programs as kind of examples, but we work in two main programmatic areas, uh, education and then science communication or public engagement. Um, I'm more on the public engagement side of things. Um, and one of the projects that I've been working on is called Aquí Nos Cuidamos, uh, which translates to Here We Take Care of Each Others. Um, and this is a project that started during the pandemic as a response to a massive gap in information that was in Spanish, life-saving, like relevant, culturally relevant to Puerto Ricans during the pandemic. 
and all of the educational materials, all of the public health campaigns that were created in that program were directly sourced and co-created with a group of community ambassadors. So that program really embodies that co-creation and kind of that back and forth um, openness and iteration that is very essential and central to civic science. Um, another project that I also work with is called Ciencia Colab, where we have a cohort of community ambassadors, community leaders, um, and we give them the tools and resources to kind of create their project proposals. We give them funding to implement them. We help them implement them. We kind of uh, connect them to our network of resources, be it partners or government officials or funders or whatever their need might be. Um, so our role in that sense is kind of in a way leveraging our privileges, our areas of expertise and our access to all of these resources that a lot of our ambassadors just don't have access to and giving them those resources and letting them kind of run with them. We're not dictating what the project should be. We're not giving them like following orders or anything like that. We're more there as a support and to kind of um, really just leverage those access to those privileges that we have. So that I think is another um, element of civic science that's kind of really embodied in that program. I'm sure I can go into every single program in Ciencia Puerto Rico and break it down, but for the interest of time, I'll just leave it in, at those two. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning access too. We'll come back to this question, but feel free to um, share the website of your organization in the chat too. And then maybe Jelana, if you wanna go next. Sure, so, um... So I did my postdoc at Stanford School of Medicine. Um, um, and in the lab that I was in of Dr. Um, Abby King, we actually developed um, an, um, a methodology um, called Our Voice. And so with this methodology, we're basically using a um, digital, digital citizen science where we uh, designed an app and train community residents to use the app. And they go out into their communities and they take, um, we had this broad broad prompts, you know, where they basically will take uh, pictures of features of their environment that make it easy or, um, easy or harder for them to um, be healthy. And so these data are um, geocoded. So they take uh, photos um, and they take, um, um, Oh, and they record um, narratives um, about um, their environments. We train them in advocacy skills, and um, then we connect them with local decision makers um, that can kind of um, that relate to some of the main themes that you know kind of came out of um, uh, their data collection. And so the community members, you know, they go and they um, you know analyze the data and select you know, those uh, community challenges that are important yet feasible for change. And they, like, like I said, share those with the policymakers. And this has led to uh, rerouting of buses, uh, funding allocation in low-income communities, um, installation of speed traps um, in communities where older adults and affordable housing sites were getting hit by cars. And there's also a capability to even map these data such that a policymaker or local decision maker can go and um, see what the issues are of their constituents in their community. So, and they can filter it. Like there's so many capabilities um, with our voice. Um, and so I've used this in different capacities. And right now I'm, I'm using it as an educational tool. So taking this research design and trying it in uh, classrooms, because um, I teach students that live all over um, all over the world. And so it's interesting to see what their the challenges are. So like food insecurity in one community, it could be very different in another community and seeing what factors play a role in that and who the stakeholders might be. And so I think that the goal is for the uh, community as well as policymakers to act. Um, so I could probably go on, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, very good. No, I really, I really liked your response and it's good to, we're getting a little bit towards the tools that we can use. Yeah. Um, to get into this and also the kind of impact that we can achieve. So that was a really good example of uh, the kind of um, work you have done there. Um, thank, thank you, Erica. So um, I will give as an example from uh, 
the Association of Science and Technology Centers and just how their work relates to civic science and the definition that I kind of put forward earlier. If you're thinking about science that is not centered in academia, it has to be centered within civic institutions and spaces, or at least have more capacity um, at a community level. And uh, the way that ASTC approaches it is really thinking of science centers and museums as civic institutions. So boundary organizations where scientists and communities can come together to um, address share their shared priorities, um, whether or not it's around emerging societal trends and climate resilience, you know, really following the community's um, own priorities and setting how they do this types of engagement. So they've done over the last several years in their community science initiative, a lot of capacity building um, within uh, their museums at science centers and museums as community-based organizations and, and thinking of that as the like primary approach, knowing that there is such um, extensive expertise within the museum community in turn around engagement and deeper community relationships, but also an understanding of the science. So really how, how can they best leverage their unique skill set to create these connections between scientists and communities? And I think that like is a model that can be applied in different areas. Yeah, that's really helpful. And um, all these are really great ideas for um, writing papers on. So be thinking about that because I know we have some graduate students in the audience. Um, so I want to go back to Erica, you mentioned um, about the structures. So we can get a little bit into the question of infrastructures and how uh, we can support civic science in different communities, which you all touched upon sort of how they're different. Um, what would be some incentives and rewards to help um, to make civic science uh, accepted in these communities and, and or where it is not currently? Maybe start with Erica. Um, so in terms of incentives and rewards and, and thinking about policy papers where there's a lot of room for, for greater effort is around um, the funding models, right? Like in science, you know, the money is kind of everything and sets the whole in incentive structure. And we've talked a lot about working with communities and community-based organizations in the timeline. I'm, I know I'm not saying anything to new, new to people who work in this space, but the timeline for that type of deep trust building, relationship building work um, is not matched with the timeline of traditional academic science. The funding tends to go to like institutions that uh, can act as gatekeepers. And you know because they have familiarity in the administrative capacity, to actually like apply for federal grants, like the funding goes to an institution that um, is more like ivory tower-ish. And then there tends to be issues in power dynamics with relationships with communities and the people who are actually embedded within a community context. So how do you get greater funding um, to community-based organizations themselves is always a big issue. And how do you um, think about the timelines needed to do the work that has to be done and like, long scale, like long term capacity building and, and supporting of the talent and the people that work in that space, because there's not really a clear job pipeline for a lot of that, like an example being in the pandemic, I just read in stat the other day, like during the pandemic, we knew community health workers were everything, you know, everybody held them up in terms of trusted messengers and like, you know, having the relationships in the communities that they work in and access to resources and like these really these community navigators and already community health workers are not, are starting to see a diminishing of funding as since the uh, emergency declaration for the pandemic ended. So like, that is like, is a great example of, we have such like, we have a skilled community that is even more organized than it was like four or five years ago. And they're just, there's not the right, systems and structures to support their existence, continued existence without the you know, ongoing pandemic. So um, looking at the bright spots and who we know is doing the work and actually thinking about how to get them money and time or you know, helping to navigate the like grant system, things like that. Um, and I can at some point talk about on the academic side, the like how to orient like universities and academic institutions to do more of this work, but like the biggest issue is actually at the community level, how do we get the money there? Um, so I'll stop at that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, I'm wondering about the scale of this too, maybe Jolana can speak to this because some of this, I think 
Um, we can think about funding allocated to some of these tools that would support the practice itself, but then also, uh, I'm also wondering where you see this as the, what the scale should be, or what to define as the community for you. Yeah, so um, this is a great question. And um, as Erica mentioned, funding is is major um, for citizen science work. Um, and even like even with our R voice work, it took several years for us to even get like a um, NIH um, NIH funding uh, for the work. And so I think that a lot of it is just um, funding organizations and you know you know scientists like valuing. Um, you know, the lived experiences and um, of the people that they really want to engage with. And I think that trust is a major issue um, as well. It's like you just can't, well, some people think that you can just go into community and or call them and they'll come and that's not necessarily the case. Um, and with, um, you know, civic engagement, it takes time. With citizen science, it takes time to develop the relationship. So um, I think that there has to be this kind of like, readjusting of like the expectations that you may have or what you consider the norm in, in research and put um, additional um, efforts. So we think about, you know, like skills, I'm thinking of like skills of the researchers, like, because you know, um, uh, cultural humility or just humility in general, <laughs> um, or just knowing how to engage and understanding that the community may not come to you. You might actually have to go to them, um, you know, stakeholder, uh, development, thinking outside, um, thinking outside the box, not the usual quote unquote suspects of like who needs to be at the table, but thinking about like who might be missing. Um, and there was something else I wanted to mention too. Um, and I think that part of that, like building that, um, you know, the relationship with the community could be um, worked out with are at least initiated with working with uh, like universities may have like some type of community service um, or some kind of, yeah, community service like office or something like that. Um, but I think like building those connections um, in the community are important, but they can be difficult. So you kind of need to get buy-in and that may be partnering with, you know, other people in the university or in the community uh, to help you connect. So I think you just have to be open to non-traditional, um, with maybe non-traditional strategies. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think a lot of this, um, when we talk about changes in the field, this comes down to the institutions and you know the even re young researchers who want to engage in civic science and getting beyond the barriers of the what the institution allows and and some of that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and Andrea? Sure. So I strong plus one to everything that's been said. I think the whole funding situation, the timeline for the funding, how much time is actually allocated for trust building and creating that like just relationship is never enough. And the outcomes that are expected are always crazy when it comes to how little time we have allocated for um, the project. So I think that's something that's very central. I definitely agree that a lot of this will require us thinking outside the box in a way or looking to non-conventional funding sources or funding mechanisms. An example that comes to mind is when I was an undergrad, the university I went to, they had a bus that would a transportation system of us that would connect the university to nonprofits, community-based organizations in the neighborhood. Um, and then we would do like our internships, our volunteer work, our research in those communities, and that kind of strengthened the relationship. But what usually happens going to Erica's point about the CHWs is that this work is only funded when it's an emergency or all of a sudden it's like valuable in the moment or there's like a immediate return of investment that's like easy to convince uh, the funders of. So what happened to that program is that they tried to cut it because they like weren't seeing um, that benefit. Um, so there's definitely something to be said there about how can we communicate the value of this work outside of an emergency situation. Um, 
and the value of civic science in our day-to-day -day helping us do just better science, better engagement, better communication um, on a day-to-day -day basis, not only related to climate change or during a pandemic or during a crisis. I see that you both have hands up, so go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll jump in and uh, yeah, so again, strong plus one, <laughs> Andrea, um, to the things that you said, it really like triggered a lot of, um, of, of thoughts around this. And so um, when I first became introduced to civic engagement, and I don't think it was called that at the time, but I was um, a student at Spelman College uh, working on my bachelor's in psychology. And I, I had to take one sociology course and it was called Atlanta Neighborhoods because the school is based in Atlanta. My family jokes on me to this day about like, well, what were you doing in Atlanta neighborhoods? Like who takes that kind of course? But it was actually us going with our professor, Dr. Lefevre, and in a big white van and just going and learning the neighborhoods in Atlanta, learning the history of them. We had to attend community meetings. And so in those community meetings, that is where I first saw like people coming together to solve a, a challenge in the community that was important to them. And so that class really kind of like changed, you know, the lens within which I see um, just community engagement engagement, uh, research, everything. I always think back to that course because I saw community members um, in action solving problems. And so um, I think that, you know, having that early experience helped. And I know that there are some programs um, um, that I've like heard of, you know, here and there um, across the U.S. where, you know, they are you know, teaching undergrads where they are, you know, um, about civic engagement or having them, you know, identify a community problem and work with community organizations to um, address that problem. And so I think, I don't even think I'm answering a question right now. I'm just talking and I'll wrap up, but I, I just think that this type of work should be that very early on, introduced early on, um, because it really shaped the, shaped who I am as a researcher and as a person. Uh, plus one to, again, everything that had just, just been said, I really wanted to build on um, the mention of impact and return on investment, because I think that is one of the stickiest elements of this area. So science, as it's currently done, it's it's not the best way to define impact, but we do have, like, there's set metrics. It's like, you you know, if someone's getting a tenure, you look at their publication history, you look at the, the grants that they bring in, you look at the number of students trained, it's like, quantitative it's not really that accurate to begin with in terms of quality but it's what people judge everything based on if you are talking about civically engaged science communities what what's your what's your impact metrics like we all know what it looks like to do it well right like we know the the principles and the like the like qualitative uh elements that something that is done well has but like in terms of if you needed to like say, was the, the money worth it? Was the university researcher time worth it? It's really tricky because you're dealing with social issues and people. So like just sticking in the like um, public health space, you know, if is it more impactful to take, you know, get 10 people who are from a vaccine hesitant community hard to reach, like build those relationships and encourage them to get vaccinated. And like they do, or is that more valuable than like a public awareness campaign that reaches millions of like, there's the, the numbers are different. And like, it depends on the goals of what you're trying to do, which numbers are important, but like the space, what it needs in order to actually have incentives and distance, like is clear goals need to be more clearly stated. And then we have to have a better sense of what a good ROI is, what a good metric is, that doesn't lose all the nuance of what it takes to actually do the work. Um, and that that space, I actually feel is one of the least developed areas because there's not consensus around what matters, right? Some of it is a value, like a value-based like proposition and we can't agree on like what's the most valuable thing. So um, I do think that's one of the bigger challenges that we have doing this work. Yeah, I, that's, go oh, ahead. Sorry. I, was I agree and I think that value kind of depends on the the question being asked or 
um, the, the, the challenge that's being, or they, that, they, that the community wants to address. And I did see something recently from Cornell University. Um, there's a, a lab in Cornell, I can't think of the name right now, but they have an evaluation um, guide for citizen science. And what I tell my students all the time is that evaluation doesn't start at the end. It's something that you start in the planning phase and continue all the way throughout but oftentimes it's a, it's an afterthought. And I think um, time and time again, it's an afterthought in um, citizen science. And we can be collecting, again, depending on context, qualitative data, quantitative data, looking at uh, changes in people's intention to act, changes in attitude, self-efficacy, all these types of things. So, um, and even their civic attitudes, like in the work that I'm doing with my students and testing, having them engage in citizen science processes. Um, you know, I want to see from the beginning, I did like a pre-survey uh, before the course started, and then um, they're taking another survey now um, this summer um, because the course has ended, but I want to see if their civic attitudes have changed, their civic behaviors have changed. Um, and then other metrics related to the specific questions that I have. So um, yeah, th there's a lot to be done in terms of evaluation. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad we came to this um, because I wanted to ask more about um, best practices. And since we're talking about um, building a generation of civic scientists, right? The capacity to building folks who are in the room now who are in science and want to engage. Um, do you have other ideas or thoughts about best practices or things that could be done more practically to, to engage them in either your work or just more broadly in the field? Maybe Andrea, you want to start? I mean, I probably have like a thousand responses for best practices, um, but I'm just going to go with the first thing that came to mind. Um, which might not be in the stereotypical context that we consider civic science. Um, one of the programs in Ciencia Puerto Rico is called Semilla de Triunfor, Seeds of Success. Um, and it's a mentorship program, a year-long mentorship program for middle school aged girls, where we are basically throughout the entire year giving them science training, leadership training, advocacy training, community engagement training. We're giving access to a bunch of the not only mentors that are staffed with Ciencia Puerto Rico, but really of our entire um, network. And then we kind of help them create a final project that's really um, what they want to do and something that they think would be relevant to their school, their neighborhood, their family, or whatever the scale or context is. Um, and those projects go from anything from like, we had a girl write a song that was like so cute and do a whole video. We've had some of the kids do public health campaigns that are social media and they like reach to their school. We've had some of them start recycling programs in their neighborhood or in their schools or in their church. Um, we've had some of them do workshops in their church or their family or do like trainings of whatever they learn. So I think that's uh, a great example that's kind of outside of the box that kind of embodies a lot of those um, best practices, that idea of like providing the tools, we're letting the young girls take the leadership of the project and our role is to just be there supporting and guiding them and kind of holding their hand. Um, and the way we evaluate success is just by having them finish the project and like, if did they learn something about science that we like spark any interest in them pursuing a STEM education. Um, I can think of other examples, but I'll pass it on to Erica and Jelana, um, but that might be a kind of out of the box example. Oh, okay, I can, I can jump in here. Um, so um, there's an initiative um, in the Science and Society program at Aspen Institute called um, Our Future is Science. One element of that initiative is a, a mentorship program where we pair high schoolers with um, graduate STEAM students all across the US, it's a virtual program. And so kind of like the, the core tenet of the, of the program is that you know, we want to connect <clears throat> science and social justice and you know, work with students, um, <clears throat> the mentees and mentors such that they can see science or STEM more broadly as a tool um, to solve society's most pressing um, challenges. And so um, we 
in in our social and science in our science and social justice curriculum, we have a citizen science um, activity where they go. Um, the, the mentees go into their community and identify um, a challenge that they want to address. And then we work with them over the course of like an academic um, school year um, to create um, a science-based solution for that particular issue. And so this has been, um, you know, an overwhelmingly successful and impactful um, practice and just overall initiative um, in that the, um, our graduate STEM students are now recognizing like the societal impacts of their research. So they may have come in not knowing about the connections between their specific research and how it impacts society. And then the students, um, sorry, the high schoolers are like, you know, understanding this. So we've had high schoolers um, that are now uh, about to go into their freshman year where they're focusing on like, um, you know, computer science and sociology or you know, pre-med and, um, and public health, where we've had, um, again, um, what is it called? Um, mentors, the graduate STEM students say like, you know, I can't with good conscience go into my career as a researcher and not take into account the social justice issues of what I'm doing. So we're seeing these changes. And so again, I think starting, um, starting early, but even late, you know, with the graduate doctoral students, you know, I think that there's some benefit uh, to that as well. Yeah, these are all great. Um, yes, I had another question, but go ahead. I've got to answer this one. I, I did want to I take it almost slightly in a different direction in terms of, you know, it's come up early career researchers, scientists, like focusing on that and like best practices in that space. And the way I think about the promising practices more in terms of traits, and I, there was a report, a landscape study that came out a couple of years ago on the state of inclusive science communication, and it established three traits for inclusive science communication. And I actually think these are fairly universal and can be applied to civic science and science generally, like what's the first step that needs to happen. And the, the three traits has defined was one is, was intentionality. So every scientist needs to be thinking about who, why, to what end, um, who's in the who's in the conversation, what does that mean for what I'm, but like being intentional and practicing intentionality in all that you do, not just like a intentionality because this is what the lit review said is the answer in the, you know, the gap in the science, but like what are the potential impacts, like asking those questions. Um, reciprocity, so in, in terms of um, communication engagement is that bi-directional, mutually beneficial relationship. But again, like, you know, how are in the way you're doing the work, how is, are you making sure you understand the priorities and uh, needs of the people that you're working with and have that um, reciprocal relationship? And then the last trait that they identified was reflexivity. So how are you constantly reflecting on what you're doing and asking questions about the historical context? So in an like, engagement, there's a lot of um, needing to reflect on um, uh, systemic inequities. Um, but again, like you just did a thing, how'd it go? What do I need to change? Who did it impact? And if you have intentionality, reciprocity, reflexivity, and those are the skills that you work on building as an early career scientist, you can pretty much apply it in any context and be better off for it. So in civic engagement as a researcher, like to me, those are not just science communication traits. Those are just universal traits to be a civic minded scientist. So mm -hmm. highly recommend looking into that report. I can drop the link into the chat, but that's that's where I would start. Yeah, that's a great resource. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. And um, I think a lot of that can apply to science policy also. So if we think about um, policy changes and you know writing papers on on changing policies and this, like I said, a lot of this comes back to universities. And so um, you know we're getting close to the end of time here, but I do want to touch upon this question of um, what would sort of culture change look like, right? So. In, in terms of incentives to support um, this field when it comes to, to universities, you kind of touched upon this a little bit of um, community engagement, but for example, like if you had students who want to engage in uh, what you're doing with, with CPR, for example, um, how would you go about doing that and with the university? Because I could still see that being a barrier, um, you know, either from the advisors or, or other ways for 
for them to engage or really supporting this because clearly it's really important to to incentivize this in, in institutions too but uh, I think it's still early and or not happening now so any any comments on kind of how do how can we actually start to make this culture change happen um I think a lot of it has to do with s dissemination um and people kind of see hearing about like this work and uh and you know, even with like some of my papers, they've been like difficult to publish, you know, because people are not familiar with the methodology, the small sample sizes. Um, that has been like a huge challenge. So even with our future of science that um, the program of the Aspen Institute, you know, we spend a lot of time training um, the students on storytelling and science communication and have people come talk about how to disseminate uh, what they're doing to the community. And so uh, we're starting this at a very early age and um, I think that this is like a, a huge issue, um, just like in, in my work from, from day to day. Yeah, Andrea or Erica, go ahead. I'm happy to go, okay, I'm happy to go. Um, the one thing that comes to mind is that a lot of time, and this happens with science communication as well, our work as civic science, in civic science or in science communication is almost looked as a side gig. It's never like a central part of the work we do because there isn't an incentive one um and we you know need to pay our bills and have a life so we need to have like our day-to-day -day job and then do this like passion project on the side um this isn't necessarily a solution that I'm offering but that's just but it's something that I think all of us can relate to kind of having those multiple hats and having our more like traditional career and then on the side um, doing our more civic science focused work or our more science communication work to kind mm -hmm. of um, address that passion. Um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Erica for the interest of time. Um, promotion and tenure reform. If you're talking about science, you're talking about promotion, like culture change comes down to promotion and tenure reform. Like that is the whole, like unless people are evaluated like a, on it for their career investment, it's going to be a side hustle and it's going to be a side thing. It's an added or an undervalued, like, and this applies to everything we think is a valuable, like I would, I would argue that we should make, should not make civic science its own part of reform, but we talk about like interdisciplinary science and collaborative science and um, science communication, better teaching, better mentorship. Like there are a lot of things that we know would make academic science better that are not appropriately valued in our um, promotion and tenure system. So I think that is the number one place. And I would argue the way we, there needs to be more of a conversation how that reform of in, um, advancement and career assessment within universities should be tied to the fact that a lot of universities are declining in their public stature. So more so everybody talks about trust in science, which, you know, it's gotten more polarized. It's it's still high compared to other institutions, but it definitely has had some polarization. University trust is like plummeting. And some of that has to do with, you know, student loans and a lot of other things. But like universities are not considered trusted to be trusted institutions to have good relationships with their communities. And that is part of, you know, partly related to how they structure themselves and staff their, you know organizations. So maybe that is an area actually to push for a movement of reform. So I'll just, I'll leave it there. I totally, I totally agree. And um, I was at an international conference um, recently and I saw um, some colleagues that I hadn't seen in, in a long time. And there, when I was doing um, a lot of my citizen science work um, years ago, they were like, what are you doing? Like, just kind of confused about it. But the keynote for this conference was um, my uh, was my former mentor Abby King at um, at uh, at Stanford who talked about the R voice uh, research method our our voice citizen science methodology and it was the opening keynote everyone was there and so then my colleagues were running up after me afterwards like oh and these are my tenured colleagues who were always just like like what are you like just so confused about it and then they were like oh wow we should do a project together using the methodology. Like they were all in it. And I was just like, this is very interesting. But I think it took her having that keynote presentation at that major conference to kind of like open their minds a bit and see the value of it. So super interesting. <laughs> 
Yes, thank you for all your comments. Uh, well, we're almost at time here, but uh, thinking through everything you said in, in the light of the special issue, and if you're writing a paper on this, you know, thinking through the changes you want to see, right, in policy and what kind of things uh, they can write on. And uh, wanted to just finish with this last question of uh, what would you write a paper on now? What would you advocate for to change in this space um, if you're doing that now? Maybe start with Jolana since you're Oh. Well, so I will be writing a paper just on me adapting this, um, the R voice methodology as a teaching tool. And um, I think that, uh, you know, that could have implications for others who want to try to explore um, citizen science. And so I have colleagues at other universities who are wanting to, who, who want to use the, um, you know, the curriculum that I developed and, um, you know, it will be interesting to see where it goes. And so, uh, but I do plan to publish the, this academic perspective of how to integrate it into um, courses. So I may submit it to <laughs> uh, this issue. I'm not sure yet, um, kind of thinking through that, but yeah. Very helpful, thanks. Andrea? Uh, I'm also planning to submit something to the submission, um, but I've been thinking about which we all touched on is the funding mechanisms and how there's never enough time allocated to, you know, create those relationships, build that trust in the community, but the final outcome of the grant is very much dependent on how that relationship is constructed and, and how much that trust is cultivated. Um, so there's definitely a contradiction there um, that uh, is very apparent to all, those of us who kind of do this work, but it isn't necessarily clear to the funders. Um, so that's something that I think is very important to kind of address and tackle. Erica? So if I had to write something right now and I had the time to think about it and write it, I question that always comes to my mind that I, I think is, I don't hear enough about is like, what would you, what would a system look like if you were to design it from scratch, knowing what science is now, knowing what we want it to be, ignoring what came before it. So like ignore the peer review process or grant making process or promotion and tenure system. What would you, for any of those things, like what would you design science as from scratch? What would be the way that like, given the fact that we live in a 21st century society where you could put things on the internet, what would publishing look like? What would be considered publishing? Like what is an output of science if we were to rethink it completely um, from like the root issue? And then how would you have to design that system to have all the things that we know and value now? Like I, we the reason why we keep doing patchwork things is partly because we don't actually have a clear idea of what the alternative structure would be and what the gold standard of how to push for it is. So like, given the fact that there are things, uh, you know, AI is going to change the way that we do, like how much time we need to spend on scientific research and like, like the lit reviews and things like that, where, how do we use the current efficiencies of the modern society to completely change um, how science is structured? So like some really high, like lofty visions of what it can be would be great. That's great. Well, that's a great um, thought to close on. This was a great conversation. We could have gone probably another hour. So I really enjoyed listening to all of your perspectives. Um, so just to close, I shared oops, a few of the um, links in the chat, and then I'll tell you about the next event as well. But thank you again um, to our sponsors and partners. Um, I shared all of our channels too. You can follow us uh, on social media. Um, we have all the recordings on YouTube and also shared the link to the um, uh, next event and the call for papers. And so we have September 5th, uh, we'll have our next um, second and last webinar, which is uh, on tools for equitable and inclusive civic engagement and policy change. So we'll focus a lot on diversity and access that we didn't get to um, discuss a lot today, but um, slightly different angle and also another area to, to discuss. Um, we'll talk about tools for our next generation to engage in civic science, um, community engagement, and also um, how do we make the field, keep and make the field more interdisciplinary, equitable, and inclusive. 
So um, join us on September 5th. Again, it'll be a, a lunchtime Eastern webinar, and then um, we'll have all of the recordings on YouTube as well um, for you all to view. And thank you again for today. Um, we'll post the recording on YouTube and um, looking forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks again. Thank Bye, you. Everyone.